What's up, Packer fans? Welcome back to the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. Today, it is part two in the undrafted free agent breakdown. Yesterday, I had the opportunity to go through the offensive players. Today, we'll be going through the undrafted rookie defensive players for Green Bay. And before I get there, I just want to say thank you. If you are listening to this episode or you listened to yesterday's episode, I appreciate you nerding the heck out with me because I fully understand and realize that these two episodes are actually two that I spend some of the most time on because I'm breaking down and reviewing film for 14 different players. Um, while also knowing that it's not going to be exactly the most watched episodes in the world because I get that the thirst for like undrafted free agent breakdowns is probably not that great, especially here on May 18th as we're, what, a couple weeks past the draft. So I just want to say for those of you who are listening and nerding out about undrafted defensive free agents for the Packers with me, thank you. Uh, You are hardcore fans and I appreciate you and I hope you enjoy this episode. So Let's jump in right away. I apologize, by the way, I'm fighting a little bit of allergies and stuff. So if I sound a little bit different, my apologies, but let's get into Akil Byers first. Um, We're going to go through, uh, obviously, like we did yesterday, we'll go through sort of their basics and then, you know, a handful of good things, a handful of things that they're going to need to work on. So for Byers, a 0.30 RAS score. So not even a first percentile athlete as a defensive tackle slash defensive lineman a very, 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 very poor athlete. We'll get to that. 23 years old. He is a senior out of Missouri, 6'3", 308. On the positive side, he shows his ability to get his hands on offensive linemen. He will stack them. He will shed and he will go make a play. He has really good hustle down the line of scrimmage. Green Bay has been all about finding players who are going to rally to the football, hustle down the line and not give up on plays. Akil Byers definitely has that. Overall, I feel like he uses his hands pretty well. Listen, if you are not a high-end athlete and you are going up in trench warfare against some of the best offensive linemen, at, you know, and you're going against you know top competition at the University of Missouri, you better have something, right? For Byers, I thought his hand usage was pretty darn good. And despite his struggles against double teams, which we'll touch base on in a second, I thought he was actually a pretty stout run defender when he plays with good pad level. So he's going to have to be a little bit more consistent in that regards. And listen, I'll say it again. If you're not an ideal athlete, everything from technique you know, to just like mastering your craft has to be perfect, right? Because you're not going to win with pure athleticism. So uh, he's going to have to get better at making that pad level near perfect. But when he does play with good pad level, he is a pretty stout run defender. And one athletic attribute that he does have in his favor is he does have very long arms and he does use those to his advantage. So if he's going to have one thing, for Byers, it's going to be his long arms and hand usage, which again allows him to disengage and go make a play. Add that to some hustle, and you get a player that had some success at Missouri. On the flip side, we already talked about the athleticism, right? Very poor athlete, struggles to hold up against double teams, just doesn't have much of a shot. If he gets double teamed, he's going to get pushed backwards. Um, and while, while he's an extremely poor athlete, I do want to mention, you wouldn't know it. So not entirely. So if you just turned on his film, you wouldn't look at him and be like, that guy's a awful athlete. You can tell he's not a top tier athlete. You can tell he's probably not even an above average athlete, but you wouldn't look at him and be like, that's one of the worst athletes at the defensive tackle position in combine history, right? Or like in testing history. So it's, it's poor, but you wouldn't completely know it just by watching the film. Um, He only has two sacks in his career, and the most pressures he had was this past season, and he only had 17. So he has no real pass rush ability and no pass rush plan. There's no great aspect to his game. He has incredibly limited upside, and he was the second slowest 40-yard dash for a defensive tackle in the past 20 years. The only person who was slower was Terrence Cody, who like weighed like 50 more pounds than him. So again, poor athlete who has good hustle, um, uses his long arms to his advantage, and is going to have to really shore up his technique to have a chance in the NFL because of his athletic testing. All right, next up is Hawati Pututau, Pututau, excuse me, Hawati Pututau, easy for me to say, 6.99 RAS score, so almost a 70th percentile athlete. The downside here, he is 26 years old. He is a senior out of Utah, 6'3", 306. So 26, you are very, very, very overaged at this point. 
uh, effort player who plays assignment sure team defense. So he's not going to be the star. He's not going to be the guy that's making all the plays, but he's going to do all the little things that set his other players up for success with, again, high motor, high energy, high effort. So that's the type of player that he's going to have to be if he makes it in the NFL. At only 6'3", his pad level is consistent and he's always finding ways to win with leverage. So that is definitely a positive. He's constantly working to gain an advantage with his hands. So his hands are always working and always working to find some advantage. And he did show some ability to hold up against double teams as well, unlike Byers. So that could work to his advantage. On the flip side, 10 missed tackles in 2021 and as a 27.4% missed tackle percentage. So that's really, really tough. As I mentioned, he's overaged at 26 years old. He lacks any sort of explosiveness or closing ability. His ceiling is probably just a rotational run defender. He struggles disengaging from blocks and there are far too many plays where he's just running into a defensive lineman and that, like that's it. Like he's just, all right, I'm going to run in and I'm going to do something and I have no idea. Like I have no plan of attack. And it's literally just like him like running into an offensive lineman and him running into an offensive lineman and there's nothing there. So he's going to have to just get better with an overall plan of attack of how we can disengage and how we can get past offensive linemen because right now he doesn't have a huge plan for doing that. All right, next up is Chauncey Manic. 3.63 RAS score, 24 years old, a senior out of Louisiana, 6'3", 246. The good news here is he has 21 career sacks, 111 career pressures, including 40 pressures this past season and 11 sacks in 2021. In fact, he had seven sacks and 23 pressures in just his last five games that he played in college. And four of those sacks were against Malik Willis, who was one of the top quarterbacks taken in this last year's draft or this current draft, right? Also, the, one of the things that I always learned about pass rushers uh, from a scouting standpoint is never undervalue their production as a pass rusher. If somebody knows and finds ways to consistently get to the quarterback, that's usually something that translates. So even if they aren't a top tier athlete, if they have some sort of rare ability to just win and get to the quarterback and have that sort of just a, a sack master mentality, right? Of like, I'm just going to, like, I'm going to find a way through hell or high water to get through this person in front of me and go get the quarterback. There are just some people that are born with that DNA that know how to hunt quarterbacks. And when you have 21 career sacks, 111 career pressures, and again, showing his saving his best football for last at the end of his college career, which if you're Green Bay, you're hoping that that was a sign of things to come and sort of the light bulb went on. If that's the case, uh, that, that's what Green Bay's hoping for, right? So don't ever really undervalue that production. And he had that production, especially at the end of his time at Louisiana. Um, he played incredibly assignment sure football, especially versus Malik Willis. Listen, if you are a quarterback hunter, you want to do everything in your ability to just go and get that quarterback right. But when you're facing somebody like Malik Willis, you have to stay in your lane. You have to stay in your alley. You can't get over aggressive because he's going to run around you. I thought he did a really good job of playing assignment sure football in that game. And the more I watched him, the more I saw that on tape. Uh, he has a very good first step off the line, generally wins with quickness off the edge. He can play on the left side or the right side, so it's not like he has one preference. He holds up pretty darn well, and he has a lot of effort that he gives against the run. He keeps working, so like there's no quit in his game, and he works really hard to set an edge. So again, at 246, 6'3", he's not the biggest guy in the world, but he does everything in his power to get outside and to set that edge so it funnels everything back inside. So just a very hard worker. He also showed off a really nice stutter step where he, he stutter steps, sort of jukes the offensive lineman, swipes their hands, and then accelerates to the quarterback. So he does have some moves in his arsenal. Now the downside, he does not look the part. So all these players like that the Packers drafted, I've been telling you, they looked the part, they looked the part, they looked the part. You look at Chauncey Manic and you're just like, ah, I'm not sure he exactly looks like an NFL edge rusher. That 3.63 RAS score, 36 percentile athlete definitely shows up on time. His speed rush that he wins with is unlikely to have the same level of success in the NFL just because he's not a super high-end athlete. It's not like he's going to win against NFL offensive tackles with just that speed move consistently. So he's going to have to vary it up and get a few more moves in his arsenal. And he's going to have to spend some time in the weight room and just put on some functional strength as well because effort with setting the edge is a really good thing, but effort with strength is even better. If he can put on some functional strength, that is definitely going to help him. 
All right, next up is Ellis Brooks. 5.55 RAS score, so 55th percentile athlete at linebacker. 22 years old. He is a senior out of Penn State. 6'1", 226. Uh, some real positives here. Looks very clean dropping into coverage. He's an effective quarterback spy. Should be able to hold up well against most running backs in coverage. I'm not talking about like your Christian McCaffrey, who's basically a wide receiver, but you get your average running back, you know, swung out wide and he has to go cover. He should hold up well. Again, he's only 226 pounds, moves pretty well. He can't win with physicality, so he wins by slipping blocks and faking out blockers. So does that with a high level of effectiveness. And he has no fear and will make quick, decisive decisions. He just plays fast, right? So at linebacker, sometimes you want to see players just like read and react, right? We've seen linebackers in Green Bay that are so hesitant to go make that play. And yes, yeah, sometimes you need to be safe, but really like Brooks's ability to just trigger on what his read is and go make a play. On the flip side, uh, his pr overall production, like 1,772 snaps in his career. He had four sacks, three forced fumbles, one interception, and two pass breakups. Now, in like a season, that's good, but like, what, what is that? Seven, eight, 10 total plays, basically. He made, basically made 10 plays in 1,772 snaps. Four sacks, three forced fumbles, an interception, and two pass breakups. Now, I'm sure he had some tackles for loss as a linebacker as well, but just wasn't exactly stacking or stuffing the stat sheet. I do that every time. Stuffing the stat sheet um, and, you know, when it came to playmaking and uh, making those big game-altering, game-changing plays. Definitely on the shorter side, smaller, and weighs less than even Tariq Carpenter. So Green Bay drafted a safety in the second, or excuse me, the seventh round, who is bigger than Ellis Brooks is as a linebacker who's an undrafted free agent. He's not very physical at the point of attack. He's not a terrible athlete, but he's not big, fast, or strong, right? So and from the scouting standpoint, you always hear scouts talk about you know, you want size, speed, strength, right? Size, speed, strength. Well, he doesn't have size. He doesn't have speed. He doesn't have strength. So he doesn't have any of those things working in his favor. He definitely has some agility and change of direction concerns. And he has inconsistent instincts. I think that's the first time I've ever labeled a player with inconsistent instincts. There are plays where you swear, like he knows what play is coming and he makes a play in it. There are other plays where he's just totally lost and it's like, he, he has no idea what's going on. It's really weird. I think a part of that is his, his trigger, right? So I talked about him playing fast, triggering and going and making a play. I think he's just reading and reacting. And I think sometimes that gets him into trouble. I think when it looks good, it looks like his instincts are really good. And when he triggers the wrong way, it looks really bad. So I think that plays a part in it, but it's just inconsistent. And then the other disappointing thing here, right, is like if Brooks is going to make the team, he has to be an impact special teams player. He only has 26 coverage snaps on special teams in his entire career, at, or at least his entire career at Penn State. So he didn't do much of it. And that's where he's going to have to make his name if he wants to make this team. All right, next up, another inside linebacker, Caliph Bryce, 7.20 RAS score, 22 years old, senior out of Florida Atlantic, 6'2", 233. So love the fact that he's only 22 years old, um, had 139 career coverage snaps on special teams. And I do believe he has legit special teams upside. So he didn't play a ton of special teams, but he played enough. And I do think that his profile matches well to what Rich Passaccia could want on his special teams unit. And I do think he has an opportunity to make his name uh, on special teams first and still have some upside at the linebacker position. As I mentioned, he's only 22 years old, so he does still have some developmental upside. He's a very nice lateral mover that can put on the brakes and go make a play. He's a pretty consistent tackler. His explosive testing showed up on tape as well. He tested in the 91st percentile in the vert, 95th percentile in the broad jump, and 86th percentile in the 40-yard dash. So he actually has some real athleticism traits that should translate to the NFL. And I do like his upside to become better at spying and blitzing and covering. I do think if he can continue to develop and start making a name on special teams, I do think there is a, a legit upside here where he could be a player for Green Bay down the road. Now, he has a lot of work that he needs to put in and it's gonna take some time, but I do see some real upside here with Caliph Bryce. Now, same thing sort of with Ellis Brooks, was not a playmaker, right? So in 1,025 snaps for Bryce, three sacks, one interception, no pass breakups, right? So like just very, very little impact when it came to game-changing plays. In coverage, 
quarterbacks were 30 of 36 against him, 271 yards, two touchdowns, one interception, and 105 quarterback NFL quarterback rating when targeting him. So while I do think he has upside as a potential coverage linebacker and that he can get better at that, it has been a struggle for him at times. He's definitely a bit on the lean side and he definitely could add some functional strength. He's certainly overmatched against more uh, physical offensive linemen. If they can get to the second level and match up with him one-on-one, he's going to get overpowered. And his change of direction testing was brutal, 0.94 in the short shuttle, so less than the first percentile, and 2.13 in the three cone, so only 21st percentile there. So really, really struggled with the agility testing. All right, next up is Raleigh Tejada. 8.21 8.21 RAS score, so an 82nd percentile athlete at corner, 24 years old in June. He's a senior out of Baylor, 5'10", 191. Really liked that he was comfortable playing left, right. I do think he may ultimately end up as a slot type corner. Showed the ability to blitz off the edge, which also leads me to believe he could eventually be a slot type corner. Very competitive with a very good football IQ. He's certainly athletic enough for the position. He's legit 4-4-3-40 speed, and he does play fast. It matches his testing. He was a 37-game starter, so has a lot of experience under his belt. Fluid hips, showed some natural coverage ability, and not afraid to throw his body around despite being undersized. And oh, by the way, he also had an interception on the first day of rookie minicamp as well. Now, there's some negatives here as well. Quarterbacks had NFL quarterback ratings of 113.2, 102.9, and 114.1 when targeting him over the past three seasons. So he's an interesting player. And I think when you look at him, you're like, all right, that looks like a corner. He's got pretty good testing. He's a little bit shorter, but like he, he looks good, but he keeps giving up completions. And I just think I'm hopeful with NFL coaching, he can clean up some of that stuff because there's times where he's just playing too far off and he can't make up for it and wide receivers are just getting easy separation. So I do think there's a world where he just gets NFL coaching and maybe plays in a different scheme and things click for him, but he just consistently gave up completions in college, which is sort of a problem when you're a cornerback. Um, Only 25 coverage snaps in his career on special teams. So again, for somebody who's going to have to make his name on special teams, he hasn't done a ton of it. He's very under, well, very undersized is probably a little aggressive, but only 5'10", also has very short arms. So if you're on a bigger wide receiver on the outside, not only is he short, but the short arms definitely plays into that as well. So his wingspan is very, very poor. Um, His backpedal is choppy and his click and close needs a lot of work. And while he gives effort as a tackler, once again, that size plays a factor and he's not going to be an impact tackler in the NFL. And then last but not least is Trey Sterling, 4.58 RAS, so a 45th percentile athlete at safety, 23 years old, senior out of OK State, 6 foot 205. When quarterbacks targeted Sterling, they were 63 of 83 for 610 yards, very high percentage, but only two touchdowns, three interceptions, and only a QB rating of 88.9. So as a safety, you will definitely take that. Has 121 coverage snaps on special teams, and I do think he has the ability to make his name on special teams first. I think his skill set fits really well with that. Only has three penalties in his career. I think he shows off really good instincts in run defense and has the ability to come down and fill an alley, which is so important in this Joe Barry defense. He was on the watch list as a preseason All-American, but an injured wrist cost him almost the entirety of 2021, and he only played 116 total snaps in 2021. But going into the season, he was Pro Football Focus's seventh ranked safety with an 82.1 overall grade this past season and an 85.3 coverage grade and was on the Senior Bowl watch list as well. So this was a legit safety coming into the season. People thought he had the ability to maybe be like a a day two draft pick, maybe early day three. Has basically misses the entirety of this past season. Again, only what 100, you know, 116 snaps and just kind of fell off the radar. So you're hoping for the Packers that he goes back to playing how he did his two years prior where he put really good film out there um, and that this last year with the injury was just a, a little bit of a fluke and he can get back to his form where he was a couple of years ago. And most likely he's going to fit more as a box safety in the NFL. I do question whether he can be a true fit as a, like a true free safety, but if he's coming up, if he's playing the run, I do think that's where he's going to ultimately be best. 
As mentioned, a wrist injury cost him most of 2021. His lack of athleticism definitely shows up in coverage. Even though the stats were good, um, I do think that you could tell at times that athleticism was hurting. A 47140 is only in the 20th percentile for safety, so lack of speed needs to take much better angles. And because of his lack of speed and because of you know his poor angle taking, he's not the guy that you want as the last line of, of defense. And I do question if he can stay at safety, but if he puts on weight and tries to be like a hybrid linebacker safety, he's only going to get slower and he's already basically too slow, right? So I just think fit is going to be a question there and he's going to have to make his name on special teams. Overall, my three favorite defenders from this undrafted class, Caliph Bryce, definitely number one. I think Chauncey Manick is still number two. I think you're hoping maybe that that pass rush productivity will carry over. And then number three, I, I like Tejada a little bit. I like Sterling a little bit. I like Brooks a little bit. I'm going to go with Tejada uh, as my number three. So I'll say Bryce one, Manic two, and Tejada number three. Um, you look at how these players have a potential chance to make the roster. You look at Bryce and Brooks. We know Quay uh, is going to make the team. We know Campbell's going to make the team. We know Barnes is going to make the team. But after that, you just have to beat out a group of Isaiah McDuffie, Ty Summers, and Ray Wilborn, right? So there's definitely an opportunity and they could keep five as well. So I, I think there's a real opportunity there for, for both Caliph Bryce as well as Brooks to potentially find a spot there if they can go out and play well. For Manic, you know, right? Like we know Gary and Enigbare and Preston Smith are going to make it, but Randy Ramsey, Jonathan Garvin, Tipa Naliai, Ladarius Hamilton, Kobe Jones. None of those guys are guaranteed roster spots. And then with Tejada, once again, you know Razul Douglas and Jair are going to make it. Kayshawn Nixon probably makes it. Shamar Jean Charles probably makes it. But you're probably keeping six or seven. And the next up is KB Anento, Rico Gafford, and Keandre Thomas. So there are some real advantages. Even Trey Sterling, right? Amos and Savage make it. Sean Davis, Vernon Scott, Tariq Carpenter, Innes Gaines. I like some of those guys, but none of them are locks to make the roster. So I do think there is some real opportunity for these defenders to potentially make the team. That is going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. If you made it through two undrafted free agent videos on offense and defense, you have uh, officially made the Packers nerd list. So congratulations. Appreciate you greatly. We'll be right back here tomorrow with an all new episode. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.